All right, good morning, everyone. We're gonna get started. Um, welcome to Shell on Earth, From Browser to System Compromise, with Matt Malin Yahweh, Jaisal Spellman, and Abdul Hariri. Um, before we begin, um, it's a reminder to please stop by the business hall located in Bayside AB to visit all of our vendors. Um, and there's a welcome reception there tonight from 5.30 to 7. The Black Hat Arsenal is in the Palm Foyer on level three. And remember to join us for the Pony Awards in Mandalay Bay BCD at 6.30. And please remember to put your phones on vibrate. Thanks. Hi there, everybody. Um, this is a Shell on Earth. Uh, there's a dollar sign in the title. Uh, it's a shout out to all the Unix users out there, which is everyone now because the Windows has a bash. <laughs> and uh, to all the non-technical people, they ask why you have a dollar sign in your title. It's uh, because it makes your uh, your uh, talk uh, more baller with the S instead of the you know the dollar sign instead of the S. So today we're going to be talking about uh, the Pwn Own contest evolution, uh, history of Pwn Own remote browser to kernel exploits. Uh, the full attack chains of the eight winning submissions of uh, Pono in this year, and then we will conclude. So my name is Matt Molnyawe. I'm a security researcher for the Zero Day Initiative. Um, in my spare time, I was a two-time United States finalist uh, competition DJ, um, and that's what I do for fun. And uh, that's why my Twitter handle is DJ Manila Ice. So I'm also playing uh, the DEF CON party uh, later in the week. So. Come check it out. Hello, my name is Abdul. I'm a security researcher working for the ZDI. Um, I've been working for the ZDI for the past three years. Um, of course, ZDI, which is part of Trend Micro's tipping point. Um, I do a lot of uh, bug discovery and root cause analysis. Jason. Hey, I'm uh, Jaisal Spellman, more commonly known as Wandering Glitch, and I'm also with ZDI. I've been with ZDI since 2012. Uh, tried and focused mostly on reverse engineering and static analysis, and in my free time, I like to play instruments and go rock climbing. So, if you haven't heard of Trend Micro's Zero Day Initiative, or the world's largest vendor agnostic bug bounty program, we're focused on vulnerability discovery and remediation, and uh, we do research into advanced exploitation techniques. Also note, we are number one in vulnerabilities and CVs at Microsoft and Adobe for 2015. Now we'll go on to the evolution of exploit development uh, at Pwn Own. So prior to Pwn Own 2013, these were some of the exploit mitigations that were available to the applications that were put to the test. Um, basically things weren't easy during those times. They're pretty hard. Um, when I got started probably five, six years ago, that's a lot to catch up with and try and uh, bypass. Uh, but in 2013, we made a significant change to the Pwned Own competition where we required the full exploit chain and details around the vulnerabilities uh, to be disclosed. We also made much higher payouts to the winning exploit chains uh, to reward all the vulnerability researchers that participate in the competition. Each affected vendor uh, receives a copy of the exploit chain at the contest and are given an opportunity to ask questions from the contestant in order to improve their software. So it's a real positive thing and I'm a big fan of it. So now let's take a look at some of the exploit mitigations that have arisen from the change. Uh, here we can see some of the important exploit mitigations that have been developed and uh, Details around the exploit techniques and the vulnerabilities have um, definitely made a clear um, impact uh, into people's software and is, um, has influenced the increase of defensive technologies being developed today. And here's a slide that um, shows basically our Hall of Fame of folks that have uh, produced remote browser to super user exploit. Uh, they have bypassed pretty much all the things I had discussed in the prior two slides, and it's a tall order. And uh, you know we're really proud of these guys. So you have uh, John and Nils. Uh, you got Sebastian and Andreas. All these are great guys, by the way. Uh, the Keen team, uh, Mario Smolinski. Um, 
by the way, his uh, his system escalation bug uh, is probably the most hilarious bug at Ponyone of all time because uh, he was able to use the uh, emet installer to uh, uninstall emet and as a result get system with it. That's super wild. Who does that, man? <laughs> and uh, of course, our big winner, uh, 2015, uh, Jung Kim Lee. Um, who holds the single biggest payout in Pono in history. As you can see year after year, this type of activity where you're escalating uh, from browser remote code execution to uh, um, highest privilege um, is increasing uh, and the escalate mitigations are getting bypassed and sidestepped altogether by these elite few. Uh, but this is a really good thing because the defense uh, gets better and uh, we make things better. Uh, now let's go into this year's Shell on Earth uh, exploit chains at Pono in 2016. So now we'll be discussing the uh, Safari chain uh, produced by Team Shield of Tencent Keen Lab. And let's uh, let's start with some shells. How about that, everybody? All right. So the VM on the left is the target machine and the VM on the right is the pwn serving machine. Uh, it's sending a dial lib to get thrown into the browser to execute the privilege escalation and then there's the uh, shell over there and it's running as a root. And to prove they uh, definitely uh, got root shell and can do stuff, they uh, wrote to the root uh, pwn by Keen Lab. So now let's talk about the chain. The um, Apple uh, graphics uh, context UAF. This uh, was a use after free with a graphics object, con um, graphics context object. This uh, caused execution to die at set platform text drawing mode as you can see on the slide. Um, if you look at the pseudocode, it's controlling the this pointer if you're able to reclaim the object in time. Uh, when you're doing use after free exploitation, uh, you want to know who created the object who freed it and uh, which part of your script is uh, reusing it. So um, basically a lot of this stuff was happening during a fill text function call and uh, the free was occurring, let's see, the free was occurring with a modification to the width attribute of this um, graphics, uh, I'm sorry, this canvas object. Uh, it was basically resetting the size to it and then when you change the width it goes and deletes the old one. So basically if you uh, reclaim this, uh, you could do more interesting things uh, downstream. So let's uh, discuss the exploitation steps. So after they reclaimed um, the freed memory, they found this exploit primitive um, with uh, the save function uh, within graphics context save. And uh, that's what gave them the arbitrary right. They sprayed the memory with strings and frame objects as you can see uh, and that's the memory layout and they were able to use that write primitive to overwrite the strings uh, length um, attribute so they can read um, large chunks of memory or whatever they really wanted to and then they read in the frame view table um, pointer to bypass ASLR. Finally they uh, used the write again to write the V table of the frame object pointer and then called the blur function on it so that they can get code execution. So long story short, with uh, multiple usages of this uh, write primitive, you can do cool stuff. Now let's talk about the escalation. Um, the bug was in the multi-touch support binary and uh, if you look at uh, V2 in this uh, slide here, Let's say that's a uh, CF data object. Um, if you're able to reclaim that uh, by kicking off a thread and winning this uh, race condition, uh, you'll get to do more interesting things downstream. So here's a race condition details. It's invoked by calling xset global force config, uh, which resides in uh, core graphics uh, inside the Windows Server process on OS X, and. Uh, you know, shortly after the call to this uh, function, this unserialized gesture configuration uh, function, 
uh, there's another call to CF release. So if you reclaim it in time and you get this uh, CF release called on the data that you control, you can uh, make a dereference on the method call of uh, objects, uh, it's the objective C stuff, but uh, objects, ob I'm sorry, object C mesh should send when uh, the CF release is called and that's how they got direct code execution. Oh man, this is a lot. So yeah, basically with this, uh, this slide, don't let it intimidate you. They basically called the Windows server to get the connection port to be able to call their, uh, the vulnerable function. Uh, they sprayed memory and they win the race and then you hit the ROP chain uh, by uh, hitting your uh, stack divot and then uh, run your shell code. And if you're running in the Windows server, you're running as the Windows server uh, user, but all you have to do is basically call set UID zero and then you're root. So that was it. Next uh, exploit chain is Apple Safari, uh, produced by Team Sniper uh, of Tencent Team Lab. Let's kick off this demo. So a lot of this stuff is being discussed right now uh, and concurrently with uh, Team Lab. Um, in another talk, so we're just going to go over higher level how this works. Basically, they um, had a vulnerability in uh, JavaScript core, able to get a use after free, and after that, they're able to um, read whatever they want to because um, they controlled uh, the two string function, so they could read all of memory. And since you're executing in JavaScript, well, it's executable and they can redefine the two string function and uh, that's pretty much it. So the layout was exactly this, oops, the layout was basically the exact same. Um, sprayed string objects, frame objects and then just code exec. And that's pretty much it for the chain. So the details of the uh, kernel portion are being discussed right now, it's in the uh, Apple graphics uh, display driver code. The next chain we're going to be discussing is uh, Apple Safari to kernel uh, by Loki Hard. And we'll kick off this demo. So this was composed of a use after free. Uh, within the renderer process, uh, heat buffer overflow within the font D process, uh, sandbox escape to be able to um, escape the sandbox process, and then a logic error to execute, um, to escalate privileges with the sudo command, which is very interesting. So you can see here, there's a, there's the shell, and do an ID, you'll see the root, and the root, so. Popping calc, popping chills, that's pretty cool. All right, so this was found by source code auditing. Uh, Loki Hart, uh, John Kung Lee, uh, pointed straight to the WebKit source code where this uh, use after free was occurring. Um, in this case, uh, he noted that if M queues is null and only M regions exist, set track zero on the items in M regions never gets called. So after that, you got your dangling pointer start reclaiming. So the exploitation steps go as, as so. Uh, he uh, leaked a heap address off of a list object within the M regions. Um, he sprayed a series of string objects allocated around the track element. Um, he leaked arbit arbitrary addresses with the mode attribute with the associated track element. Then he sprayed array buffer objects around and uh, corrupted the aforementioned list attribute, which is that VTT region list object, uh, and achieved the right primitive, uh, allowing for out of bounds read and write access. Um, finally, this is a, a ROPless execution because it's uh, happening within JavaScript. Uh, he basically was able to get runtime evaluation um, by dropping a shell code into um, a JavaScript function, having it be evaluated, and then rewiring it to um, be called with the on queue change uh, function uh, within the reclaimed object. So now we'll talk about more privilege escalation. Uh, font D has a XPC, which is font object server, so you can communicate to this uh, via that name. 
And if you send a hex TUE message uh, to reach this function, uh, which allocates memory uh, of the size that it reads from the controlled um, data, um, the control pointer, um, it'll get passed down into get uncompressed bitmap re representation. Uh, get uncompressed bitmap representation contains no bounds checking and as a result you get data copied into the buffer resulting in a heat buffer overflow. So he exploited this by spraying with mock message um, and then uh, he triggered the heat buffer overflow and then he was able to leak addresses because he's already executing and he can get the addresses of the modules that are already loaded into memory and then he built his ROP chain uh, and then called mprotect to mark stuff executable and that's how he gained code exec, uh, code exec. The OSX font D sandbox escape was found by looking at this file which is the font D internal SB file which is located in user share sandbox. Uh, he found that font validator was not sandbox and after looking at the binary he saw that the environment variable um, XT framework resources path um, could be changed and he changed that so that it would point to load a module that he controlled and run his code that way. Uh, so basically is an environment variable problem and um, the stuff not running, um, not running sandboxed. So finally um, he took a look at the diagnostic um, binary that's on the system. Uh, he was able to create arbitrary directories with this. Um, this binary has a method that reads values from the diagnostic messages history plist file and if you supply a key, um, submit to local folder uh, with the value of a directory, uh, you will get an arbitrary directory created for you. So how to use this? He, uh, he basically create his directory at var db sudo and uh, with the username of the guy that's running and it makes an updated directory um, modified time and basically that modified time is checked by the sudo um, binary and if it's within a certain time range you don't have to type in the password and then if you can run sudo, well, you get your sandwich and that's how that works. And uh, yeah, you get to do rude things. So I'll turn it over to Jaisal. He's going to talk about Chrome. So the, uh, really the only uh, Chrome entry we had was from 360 Vulkan and this one was actually a little bit more uh, drama filled than uh, any of the other entries. Um, it consists of four different bugs. It starts off with a Chrome out of bounds vulnerability followed by two flash use after freeze and then finally a, a kernel use after free. Here you can see uh, they're running a notepad as system, or at least should be able to see. Um, this kernel vulnerability as well as all the other uh, Windows kernel vulnerabilities from all the researchers, they, uh, they all stole the system token by iterating through the process list in kernel land and then finding the system process with the PID4, taking that and then applying it to the current process. The Google Chrome vulnerability is especially interesting in that it was found and reported just three days prior to uh, Pwn to Own. So in 2015 we introduced a uh, change to the rules where we would consult with the vendors and if they found that they already knew about the vulnerability we would treat that uh, part of the chain as a partial. So this actually got treated as a partial. What's interesting is Google gave us a Chromium bug ID and if you look at that it was duped against another bug ID that is now uh, credited to KeenLab. So KeenLab killed a bug that 360 Vulkan was planning on using or did use and that's just quite interesting. The vulnerability itself is in iterate elements and the issue is in uh, an assumption that accessing elements of an array is safe. They knew that accessing elements of other objects is unsafe and so they had an explicit check to make sure that they were not acting on any other type of object. But array accesses were actually not as safe as they thought in that you could add a custom accessor method, a getter method that would execute whenever you access any given element. 
Looking at it in code, this is a proof of concept that will trigger the vulnerability. The interesting thing to note is evil callback here. Uh, this function will change the length of the array that's being acted upon. And as a result, it'll free the old storage so you're now acting on freed memory. Then uh, you apply it to the array prototype uh, by calling define getter and you just set it for any index. In this case, it's setting it to zero, but it could be anything. The third portion of this uh, proof of concept is just filling in the array so it has some elements that are legitimately being going to be acted upon. And then you call array.concat, which will trigger the call to iterate elements. And as a result, you um, end up going in, in this case, with an array of size uh, of four. And you go in and you then continue acting on four elements that don't actually exist. As far as exploiting this, uh, 360 Vulkan allocated an array buffer object in the freed storage and used this to craft a custom array buffer object that had a size that they were able to control. And they used this to get arbitrary reads and writes. One of the key portions of this part of the chain was leaking the address of kernel 32. And they did this by leaking the address of a text object, then using the arbitrary reads and writes, they used that to get the address of Chrome DLL. Once they had the address of Chrome DLL, they used that to parse the import address table and find kernel 32. Uh, once, they had, once they had that, they then triggered the flash portion of their exploit chain. The first part is a use after free in the handling of ActionScript 2 transform objects. This vulnerability is solely used as an information leak and th that's all it really can be used for. The issue is that transform objects contain a matrix property which is just an instance of the matrix class. And whenever you access transform.matrix, any, uh, the matrix property of any transform object, it will create a new instance of the matrix class. The issue specifically is that ActionScript 2 is very, very lenient and it, when you access the matrix class, you can actually trigger uh, user-defined code if you hook a, uh, if you hook flash.geom and add a custom accessor method. Uh, no, another thing here is ActionScript 2 is very, uh, very lenient and as a result, uh, you can, you can bind it to a, uh, to a matrix and allocate another object so you'll get object addresses as a result of, well, just reading what should have been there. The proof of concept here is fairly straightforward. We can ignore the first part. It's basically just getting a movie clip and getting a transform object that we'll access. The second part is getting access to the geom object namespace that gets modified. After that is uh, saving an original reference to the original matrix because that has to be returned so that you can actually continue a code execution properly. The most interesting part is the third part of the proof of concept where they're adding the property to the matrix, uh, to the uh, geom object. And here, in this case, they're removing the object and then just re removing the movie clip and then returning the original matrix. In the actual exploit, they replace it with a custom object that they're choosing so that they can then use it in the second uh, flash vulnerability. So all in all, uh, to exploit this, they triggered the vulnerability, then within the custom accessor, between freeing the movie clip and returning the original, they allocated a bunch of custom objects, and then they just read the val values back from the matrix property and used that to know exactly where in memory their custom objects were allocated. The second uh, flash vulnerability and the last part of the user land chain is in the handling of the load vars object. Uh, it's used after free and also in ActionScript 2. Loadvars contains a decode method which is used to take URL encoded strings and use that to set properties on an object. So if you have a string that says A equals 1, ampersand B equals 2, and you apply it on a object, it'll set it so that object dot A is 1 and object dot B is 2. The whole issue here is uh, one of the properties that's built into uh, to ActionScript, uh, actually uh, ActionScript in general, is object dot watch which allows you to set a callback that will fire whenever any property is modified. And as a result, you can modify and free movie clips and replace the object and get uh, use after free. Once again, here is the proof of concept and just as with the previous one, the first portion is not too interesting. It's just setting up the uh, variables that we'll be using. The interesting 
part is really in the second portion where you're calling mc.watch, sending it on AAA, so when AAA is set or modified, uh, this function will run. And in this case, they're only removing the movie clip, but for the full exploit, they reclaim that memory by allocating their custom objects. Uh, the last part is where you're actually triggering the call. Now, note that my LV, that the load bars object, uh, has its decode method called, but it's actually being applied so that the properties are set on the movie clip. This is the, this is uh, required for the actual exploit, otherwise the use after free would not actually occur because it would not be writing to the movie clip object. So triggering the vulnerability, uh, as part of setting the property, a dynamic call occurs, an indirect call. Um, to bypass that, the kernel 32 information leak is used so that you can actually return cleanly and continue things on for the rest of the uh, exploit. As part of reclaiming the memory, they're able to achieve a arbitrary address uh, decrement. And although this is limited, because they have the information leak from the first flash vulnerability, they use this to decrement the reference count and replace that object with a custom object, uh, or with a uh, byte array. So now they have two objects pointing to the same ad uh, address. And they have uh, the byte array which has sizes and uh, positions, and they have their custom object. Using the custom object, they're able to change the size such that it is much, much larger than it actually is, and they're able to read and write through basically all of memory just by updating position and reading and writing. The kernel portion of the uh, the chain was a use after free in surface objects. Uh, this arises due to the fact that window objects are created and handled by the Win32K subsystem, but uh, all surface objects and related objects are handled by the desktop window manager, dwm.exe. As a result of uh, some mishandling of reference counts, it was possible to uh, get an, uh, a compatible DC object to have its reference count messed up um, and it was not properly tracking things so a surface object would end up getting freed even though it, it and it was safe but the co the associated compatible device context object would not be so you'd have a dangling pointer that you could abuse. One issue with this is cleanup is vital as part of process uh, termination process death involves the cleanup of all these objects and if you don't clean things up properly after exploitation or just in general, then it would cause a blue screen and the entire system would shut down. Uh, exploitation was about standard for uh, the 360 chains. It was uh, reclaim the object with uh, accelerator table objects and then bitmap objects. And then use the bitmap objects to achieve arbitrary read and write access. And as I said when I was showing the video, they use this to iterate through the process list and seal the system token and apply it to the current process. So now I'm going to go over the Adobe Flash chain from 360. This is the pure Flash entry. Um, the previous was solely Chrome, even though it did have two Flash vulnerabilities. So here's the proof of concept itself. Uh, this starts off with a Flash type confusion vulnerability and then leads to a kernel use after free. The type confusion vulnerability is used for uh, first an information leak and then an arbitrary use after free. And the kernel use after free is used basically just to get uh, arbitrary read and write access. So once again, uh, they have Notepad running as system. The issue here is in the handling of net connection objects. Uh, net connection objects in ActionScript 2 are uh, a little bit different than your typical objects. All ActionScript 2 script objects contain a type ID as well as private data that is specific to the type ID. Typically, objects have their type ID and their private data set at the same time, but net connection objects have them set as part of establishing a connection. The secondary issue that's just inherent to ActionScript 2 and actually JavaScript, uh, ECMAScript in general is implicit type conversions where if you try to treat something as a uh, object type that it's not, it'll try and convert it to the type you'd actually like it to. And if that fails, okay, but it does offer an opportunity for executing code that may not have been uh, expected or intended. This is the proof of concept. Uh, we're actually uh, looking at it. It's probably easiest to start bottom and then look up. So net connection is called, uh, net connections connect uh, function is called, but 
uh, before that it's passed a XML object. This XML object has a custom attribute that is set. The attribute name is irrelevant but the important thing is that it's being set to this O object. And this O object has a custom to string function. The to string function is calling super and then returning a string. Calling super uh, ends up in calling the, the super constructor for net connection such that it sets the type ID. But by uh, allocating color matrix filter objects they're able to confuse color matrix filter objects as a net connection object. The reason they chose this is that color matrix filter objects contain an array of 20 floats that can be read and written. And using this they're able to uh, leak a pointer to a string, specifically the string that contains the URL that's used for the net connection. And then they write to it and modify that pointer such that they now have the ability to trigger an arbitrary use after free. They use this to uh, create a, uh, to, to craft a modified byte array object that has a custom uh, length and once they have that they have read and write access to basically all of user land memory. And at that point code execution is fairly straightforward. The kernel portion is a window use after free uh, arising from user land callbacks. Uh, this is an area that has been hit up quite a bit and still is apparently uh, occurring. The specific issue is in uh, when uh, xxx end defer window pause x calls post im shell hook message x. The issue is that they're only using a, an h wind, a uh, handle to a window, which is generally safe but post I am shell hook message x does not actually do any verification of the handle it's given. It assumes it's still valid and it's kind of hard to see here but A3 is the window handle and it is just directly uh, offsetting into the pointer in G shared info. Uh, typically you would, you would make sure it's still valid by contacting the, uh, the uh, handle manager and uh, or calling validate hwind but they were not doing that and as a result there was no incrementing of a ref reference count or any validation whatsoever. Here we can see a snippet from xxx end for windows position x and there's no validation uh, in this case it's a v52. They're just verifying that a window handle was actually passed and outside of that they call it directly with, with no uh, main maintenance of the uh, reference count. Exploitation of this was the exact same as the Chrome chain where uh, they allocate accelerator tables on top of the now freed window object and then allocate uh, bitmap objects adjacently. They use the first bitmap object to update pointers in the second so that they can just call get bitmap bits and set bitmap bits to achieve arbitrary reads and writes. And then like the previous chain they uh, just iterate through the process list and steal the token. This is Team Sniper's flash chain. Um, this starts off with a flash stack overflow and then leads into kernel land with a kernel pointer information leak and then a kernel use after free. And then here they have a command shell that is running as system. So the interesting thing here is uh, this was found as a result of a project zero uh, vulnerability. Project zero found a vulnerability in the JPEG parsing, a uh, JPEG XR parsing in Adobe Flash. Although Adobe Flash does not release source code, they have a JPEG XR parser that very, very closely matches the ITU reference implementation. And uh, Stephen Bateau of project zero found a vulnerability and published it. But what, for whatever reason neither he nor Adobe managed to see that the same vulnerability existed in the else condition. Um, it, it's actually slightly different but it's effectively the exact same where in this case RL coefs is a array of user defined user supplied values and I is supposed to be an index that is supposed to be less than 16 but because it's user supplied and there's no validation or no real validation they're able to access out of bounds and achieve reads and writes. Uh, looking at adaptive LP scan we can see that they do have a check. Um, A3 is the, is I in this case. And the only check they're uh, doing is to make sure that the value when treated as a signed integer is greater than zero. 
An interesting thing is for whatever reason in the flash debug builds, not only was there this check, but there was an explicit check that in addition to this also checked to make sure A3 was greater than 15 and in both cases it would still allow this, uh, this code path to be hit and still allow the writes to occur. I don't know why that was the case, but it was. So as far as exploiting, the vulnerability was actually triggered several times. Um, the first time was just to leak a stack address which was used to craft a fake object pointer. And they triggered another time to leak some more pointers. And then once they had that, they uh, made a function call in ActionScript where they are calling the function with over 100 arguments. It's all the exact same fake object. And the whole point of this was to update pointers within the, ob uh, within the second object and then use the second, the other object to perform arbitrary reads and writes. And once they had that, they just wrote to the stack and they just wrote their ROP directly to the stack so that they were able to return and code execution happened. It was one of, it was a very clean exploit. The kernel portion starts off by allocating a PFF object which is basically just a font. Um, it, it's a representation of a font. The information leak is effectively a logic issue where this function uh, ntgdi get emb ufi would call another function gre get ufi and it's supposed to return a an, an id that is used to reference the pff object but for whatever reason they forgot or didn't check and they were returning the kernel pointer so you had a direct kernel pointer that was being leaked to user land of a font that you had some uh control over the actual uh Exploitation from kernel land occurs as a result of this function b delete load ref, which is used as part of cleaning up a font. Uh, specifically, it's used to free resources associated with the PFF object. But the issue here is the return code was very dependent on the reference count. So if the PFF object still had any references to it, then this bottom check would fail and it would just return zero, even though it may have actually freed the associated objects. So you'd have a PFF object that has stale pointers to objects that can be reclaimed. And as a result the caller wouldn't necessarily know if the resources were freed. Exploiting this vulnerability occurs uh, by freeing the associated resources and then calling nt user convert mem handle which is an un undocumented but uh, heavily used function which allocates memory of user controlled size and user controlled uh, data. This resulted in a primitive that is kind of limited, actually fairly limited, uh, where all you could do is or an arbitrary value with two. But what uh, Keen Lab did is they used this to increment or to massively increase the size of a window object's extra byte size. So window objects have pointers to the window text, to their associated class, stuff like that. But in addition, you can have data that's specific to a given window, and that's controlled by the uh, extra byte size. They use this to call set window long pointer to modify the text pointer in an adjacent window and then they just made calls to internal get window text and nt user def set text to read and write memory and then use the exact same trick of iterating through the process list and sealing a token to get code execution. And now I'm going to hand it over to Abdul. Right, so uh, before before going through the uh, the chains, it's it's worth noting that the edge bugs uh, that we got in point one were found by um, auditing the source code of Chakra, which is which is interesting. Uh, both edge bugs from Loki and uh, from Kinti. Team. Um, so I'm going to be covering the uh, the Loki's chain here. I'm going to play a small video. So uh, basically, exploited two bugs: one in edge. Uh, the edge bug is a an uninitialized variable bug in the concat JavaScript uh, function, and uh, there's another bug that he exploited uh, to escape privileges, which was uh, a traversal traversal bug, which allowed him to load the DLL um, into um, like forcing that uh, service to load the DLL and execute code as system. Um, so as the video shows, he he was able to pop CMD and uh, gain system privileges. All right. Um, so uh, when when concat is executed from JavaScript, basically um, uh, in Chakra, the the code flow reaches concat args, and as you guys can see, uh, the sub item is um, is defined on the stack, but it's not initialized. And inside the loop, if if has item succeeds and uh, get item fails, basically it's going to push an uninitialized sub item inside the array, and that's 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 the root cause of the bug. 
It's just plain simple. Um, so as for the puck, um, so basically he defined he defined a proxy trap uh, for the has uh, method and make make it return true and then uh, set that proxy um, on an array object and and then just call concat and that's uh, that's a simple trigger. As for explo ex uh, exploiting the bug in principle, um, so in principle, like after the introduction of MGC, use after free exploitation got really um, harder. Um, so. Um, so he used a technique called misaligned reference. Basically, in principle, what, it, what he did is he allocated a bunch of objects and then uh, grabbed reference for one of these objects and then forced a free, uh, allocated smaller objects um, in a way that they, they will be misaligned against the, the original ones and then uh, used that to, uh, to leak and, and do a bunch of stuff. Uh, so this is this is um, the outcome of the spray. Basically, as you guys can see, the date objects were freed, and then you have um, the data. Um, when, when they were freed, he he allocated data view objects instead. So uh, the reference that he held against one of the data the date objects uh, basically points to offset 30 of the data view, and offset 30 basically contains byte uh, byte offset and data, and these will um, so basically the reference would treat the byte offset and the data as v table and type. Um, respectively, so that's how he was uh, able to leak memory. So uh, as for achieving read writes, um, so what he did is he basically freed the data data view objects and then allocated a bunch of uh, native float arrays, and then uh, he used the fake data view to to achieve read and write. Um, as for CFG, he uh, he used a, a set jump call just to obtain the stack address and override the return address, which is uh, which was simple. So now I'm going to discuss the, uh, the escalation piece. Um, so as I mentioned before, it's a it's a traversal bug. Uh, there's a there's a service called uh, the, the Diagnostics Hub Standard Collector uh, service. It's a, it's a long name. Uh, so basically, what it does is it it captures events in real time and processes them. Um, it exposes a comment interface. Uh, this comment interface basically exposes a method called add agent, uh, and the add agent method takes two arguments. Uh, the first argument is a DLL path, and then uh, and the second is a GUID. Um, this method doesn't really do proper checking on the path, so uh, as a result, it can end up uh, loading um, DLLs from undesired path, undesired path, basically. Uh, so this is this is a snapshot from from Ida just to show the load library call. There isn't much interesting things going on before that. It just doesn't check the path properly, and then just uh, loads the DLL. And that's how we got um, the system execution. Um, so the next chain I'm going to be discussing is uh, Keen Lab um, Edge Two System. So this is a small video. Uh, they, they exploited two bugs too. One in Edge uh, in the fill JavaScript uh, method, uh, which uh, which is an out of bound uh, access. And they also exploited the buffer overflow in uh, the DirectX graphics kernel driver. Um, so uh, in, in, in the demo here, uh, they, they were able to steal a system token and modify the edge uh, token with, with that token. So, um, so now the edge process would, would show it, that it's running in, uh, under system. All right, so uh, when calling the, the fill JavaScript method in Chakra, um, the execution flow reaches, like, it starts from entry fill. Um, so in entry fill, what happens is it fetches the length of the, of the array from, from the length property, but it doesn't really fetch it from the internal slot. So uh, in, 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 in specific cases, the length property can be overwritten. Um, later on, uh, the flow reaches uh, fill helper. Uh, so basically, since uh, the, the length can be overwritten, and then um, like out of bound access can can happen, and, and that ha that happens specifically in direct set item, uh, but the bug the the bug goes a little bit deeper than that. So since we'll, we're dealing with typed arrays, um, the execution flow reaches base type direct set item, and basically what it, it, it takes um, the index and. Uh, uh, what happens here? It, ch it actually checks for the for the act if, if the index is less than the actual length, which is from the internal slot. But it does it does it through an assert message, and it just logs the message. And later on, it just writes whatever um, um, to whatever index we specify. So that's that's how that's the actual bug. 
uh, the bucket's simple as well. Um, so basically, to just define a typed array and then um, set the prototype to uh, to another array, uh, specifying whatever size, and that's that's where the actual length property uh, overwrite happens, and then just call fill. As for exploitation, um, the exploitation technique um, that they used was just composed of corrupting the length of a JavaScript native uh, int array. Um, in their exploit, they used two, two sprays. The first spray was used to stabilize the heap, uh, and, the, and the next spray was used to fetch uh, the index of one of the objects they were able to write to. So once that once that's done, um, once they actually get the index of the, of the target object, they corrupted the length, and that's how they were able to achieve read and write. As for CFG, they use the same trick as Loki, which is uh, calling set jump. All right, so I'm going to go over the, uh, the kernel buffer overflow. So basically, DirectX uh, graphics, uh, graphics kernel driver, uh, it contains a structure called the present history uh, token, and inside that structure, there's another structure called the dirty regions. Um, dirty regions contains uh, the num rects and it contains a static array of, of rects. So in one of the methods, um, in one of uh, in one of the functions, there's a there's a bunch of cases. One of the cases, which is interesting, is that it checks if if the num rects is smaller than uh, the max the maximum number of rects. Um, so in, in in the specific code there, uh, it if, if the check fails and, uh, and then it's a, it just logs it. Um, but what happens, it logs it and it continues execution. So the execution reaches um, a memmove call and that's what, where the actual buffer overflow happens. So we're, we're, we're a little bit running out of time, so apologies guys, I'm gonna go through this really fast. Um, so as, as I've exploited, I'm just gonna go over some details. Um, so that driver basically allocates a pool. Inside that pool, it allocates records. These records are connected to each other as linked lists. So they uh, they trigger the bug to overwrite a subsequent uh, record, and then uh, they used a, a bitmap spray where they were also able to grab a reference to one of the bitmaps and achieve read and write through a set bitmap uh, bits and get bitmap bits. Um, and then they were able to steal a system token and just modify that token. Um, Matt, you want to close this? Yeah. So we're going to conclude here. And uh, big takeaways is application sandboxing is a step in the right direction. Um, but the kernel attack surface remains expansive and exposed. Um, basically, the return on investment of learning um, a code base in the kernel will net you higher privileges and it's probably uh, a good time invested. Um, exploitation is getting harder, but still very possible. Uh, write exploit primitives are a mainstay in exploits. You know, if you got it right, you could probably install Doom in like your browser if you wanted to, or write your own exploit mitigation. It, you know, you could write, so you could do whatever you want, right? Um, another takeaway is logic bugs uh, can be uh, very high impact, as we saw with um, the pseudo bug and the directory traversal bugs. And um, vulnerability exploit research is becoming increasingly popular. Uh, we see a lot of new faces every year at Pwn Um I like the new breed. They've uh, set a new standard with what they accomplish this year. Um, basically, they're humble, they work hard, and the work talks for itself. So it's also becoming a team sport because um, with the various subsystems that exploit developers need to understand, you're going to have to go to uh, various subject matter experts to uh, be able to develop uh, the code and be able to execute. Um, so exploitation is getting harder and uh, you know, that's what's happening. So um, we're kind of running low on time. Uh, if there's any questions, we can uh, take some uh, outside. Uh, we're the zero day initiative. Um, we have a vulnerability um, bug bounty program and send us your stuff. We'll handsomely reward you. So. We're also hiring too, so thank you. Thank you.